Um, hello, everybody. Um, I see that people are still joining, but let's start our final. This is our final Easter term uh, Garrett Seminar Research Talk. And uh, just please be aware that the session will be recorded. Uh, also, the Q&A session will be open after the, uh, um, after the end of the talk, and you can either um, just raise your hand and we will let you ask, uh, ask your question or send it to the to the um, uh, to the chat uh, our uh, today today guest speaker is William uh, white he is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of California Berkeley where he specializes in historical archaeology of the African diaspora historic preservation and community-based research he is also a founding member of the Society of Black Archaeologists and has been a blogger and the co-host of the Cultural Research Management Archaeological Podcast since 2012. We are very delighted to, to host you today in our in our final talk uh, on the Easter in the, on the Easter term. And the today um, talk um, title is "Cultivated Diversity in American Archaeology." Floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you for that excellent introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am honored to be here today. I didn't know I was the last presentation, so I hope I really uh, give people their money's worth. Um, uh, I appreciate the invite uh, to this uh, research seminar series because as I as I started to watch some of the other videos, I just realized you know the amazing, um, talented researchers that have come in this talk series before me, and then you know I presume this is part of you know, many different talks. And so I appreciate being invited to be part of this and I'm absolutely humbled to be uh, one of the presenters this year. Uh, I, I am coming to you from uh, California. It's a beautiful morning here. I think I had breakfast. Uh, well, I'm hoping that what I just ate is breakfast for the rest of the day, but I, I hope I'm not interrupting folks there in the UK who are getting ready for dinner, or I just was informed that it's tea time there, which I love the idea of a pre-dinner, just like I love the idea of a pre-breakfast. So, you know, I think we should expand our meal options in this world. But here in California, where I live in Hercules, California, I have to acknowledge, first of all, that it is on unceded land of the Muwekma Ohlone people, who for thousands of years have been the uh, stewards and caretakers of this land and the people who live on it. Uh, I also am an employee of the University of California, Berkeley, which is ranked as one of the highest universities in, um, in the United States, and it actually is a really excellent place to work. But I also have to acknowledge that the place that employs me uh, uh, has a museum, the Hearst Museum, that has still not repatriated over 400,000 Native American artifacts and human remains, even though it's mandated by federal law and state law in, in California. And I also want to acknowledge that that same university that's on unceded Ohlone land uh, only has 1% uh, Native American students in a state that has about 2% Native American people. It also has um, uh, about 14% Latino and Latina students in a state that is about 38% um, uh, Hispanic. It has 3.6% or 3% African American students in a state that has about 7% African Americans. And it has 3.6% uh, Black faculty as that compares to 57% white faculty in a state that only has about 36% non-Hispanic white. And so I bring all that stuff up because we're talking about decolonizing anthropology and decolonizing archeology. span And one of our um, biggest uh, beliefs, my sincere belief is that, you know, we can do a lot to decolonize this profession by being more inclusive and diversifying the practitioners. Of course, a lot of that stuff happens here at universities like uh, the University of California and other places in the United States, which are the training spaces for our future archaeologists. And so the idea is, you know, how can we create more diversity in archaeology amongst our student cohorts in hopes that those folks will go on to be archaeologists? So the talk that I'm going to give today, it really builds on an excellent talk that my uh, colleague Ayana Flewellen gave for the Garrett a research seminar series about our work and the Society of Black Archaeologists work in St. Croix, but I'm going to take more of a wider approach and uh, speak more about changing our philosophy as archaeologists in hopes of bringing more diversity into the field. I want to start off um, discussing kind of some of the uh, some of the major 
pieces of this kaleidoscope of constantly changing social and uh, academic factors that influence our ability to increase diversity. And so of course, this really simplistic Venn diagram, it centers the social justice movement, which in the United States is, is making you know, huge changes throughout society, throughout our universities, and has caused archeology span to pause for a second and really think about you know, the implications of our work and get a little bit, I feel like a little bit more serious about increasing diversity in archeology. span And you know, I'm proud to say that uh, partially as a result of this uh, social justice movement, President Biden has planned to sign Juneteenth as a holiday, a federal holiday in the United States. So it'll be a national holiday instead of how it's been recognized by states. And it'll be the first um, federal holiday signed into law since 1983 in the United States. And if you don't know about Juneteenth, it's the day that commemorates the end of slavery at the end of the Civil War in the United States, um, when all African Americans found that they were actually in fact free. And so I feel like, you know, things are changing in the United States and the social justice movement is really pushing a lot of this stuff. But of course, it's taking, uh, taking place against this backdrop of things like the rapidly changing uh, pace of technology and its integration. This talk is about archaeology, but all of us can recognize that technology is becoming uh, more pervasive and more um, uh, um, uh, integrated throughout almost all the aspects of our lives. And when we're talking about training the next generation of students, we have to definitely think about the role of that and how those things are impacting our ability to teach. Also the realities of, econ of the uh, economy in the United States, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, things were changing a lot in the United States for a lot of people. And living here in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's like an accelerated uh, you know, uh, test case of change in the United States. And th that's impacting the realities of being an employee in the United States. Then of course, on the other side are all these things that impact our ability to train that next generation, like changes in university funding structures, dissatisfaction with uh, an increasing number of students over the training that they're getting and among employers that this training is insufficient. And then of course, the enrollment gap or enrollment cliff that the United States is facing, which is the current cohort of youth from 18 to 30 years old that's coming into the university system is smaller than the previous uh, cohort. So universities across the United States are going to have to make adjustments and make changes to, uh, you know, come into this new world where there's fewer students who are eligible to go to college. So all of this stuff, it's, got, it's constantly got me thinking, you know, why prepare students for careers like 40 years plus in uh, um, archaeology company or a cultural resources company or becoming a tenure track uh, professor for 40 years when that's very unlikely. I'm starting to get more information from uh, the cultural resource management uh, industry in the United States, which is you know, kind of comparable to the heritage resources management uh, industry in the UK, that the, the, the life, the career span of archeologists in the United States is very short. And there's a lot of attrition over the years. And then um, fewer and fewer individuals stay in for 20 plus years. So. If you think about preparing a student for a life where they're going to have, you know, 10 different career level jobs, how do you pre prepare someone for that when archaeology is just one of the many careers they're going to have? Uh, you know, how can you continue training students at all when this constantly changing university structure? And our, our university structure is changing both out of a necess economic necessity, a demographic necessity, but also because it's not providing what students need to be viable in the workforce. And then archaeology is coming right from colonialism. It's a pursuit. Anthropology was derived from the colonial experience, right? And so our profession comes from those origins and trying to include students of color in a field that has not necessarily, uh, you know, represented their histories, but in fact has a lot of times appropriated their cultural patrimony for its own uses. Um, you know, that's definitely a, a big hurdle. And then, of course, for this uh, effort to work, trying to um, uh, um, trying to change society, what role will archaeology play in this uh, social justice movement that's ongoing? Um, so, real quick, I want to go through uh, some things that I put together about the situation of archaeology in the United States. Uh, I don't talk about how many archaeology students there are in the United States. It's really difficult to figure that out because anthropology is one of the four fields uh, that archaeology is taught in the United States. So at university departments, 
archaeology students are in anthropology departments. I can figure out information about our anthropology departments, but it's difficult to figure out how many of those folks are actually anthropology students. So that's why it's easier to turn to something like the cultural resource management or uh, the wider industry in the United States. Now, it's difficult to figure out um, true numbers from that because it's hard to know what's considered an archaeologist. And like I said, many archaeologists don't stay very long in the field. But um, information coming from careerexplorer.com, one of the career aggregates in the United States, shows that there's about 7,600 archaeologists. The United States Bureau of Labor and Statistics counts a, a little bit more than 8,000. And my colleague, Doug Rocks McQueen, has estimated back in 2014, there were about 11,000 archaeologists in the United States. Now, the best thing is that there's projected growth. There's also growth in the total amount of money being spent on cultural resource management in the United States. This information is coming from the Canelo Group and um, uh, Jeff Altschul, who is one of the members of that, who told me in 2020 that the United States spent about $1.4 billion on cultural resource management, which includes about $349 million in direct archaeology fieldwork costs. So those you know, 8,000 or 11,000 individuals are behind a lot of um, funding for that could potentially be used for archaeology in the United States. There's also a potential for even more money to be spent if the Biden administration goes through with its green jobs and infrastructure plan, which will need a lot of compliance with construction and development uh, projects as they will fall under a legal nexus that requires thinking about historic properties prior to construction. Now that all, that, that sounds great because when I started archaeology, it wasn't necessarily like that. But um, it seems like there's potential for folks who are graduating that want to do archaeology in the United States. But all of this is running into a really complicated situation when we're talking about a smaller cohort of students who are coming into universities, an increased cost of uh, um, public institution prices. So it's costing more for students to go to college. And it's also difficult for young people to even just afford to live. I mean, the, the median rent in the United States over the last 10 years or so has grown uh, explosively. In places like the Bay Area, it's, it's getting to obscene proportions compared to what a student actually makes. So that's one of the major difficulties that universities in the San Francisco Bay Area face, finding a way for students to actually feed themselves and live in, uh, you know, in a dwelling while they're going to college. Um, and there's also overall increase in the cost of living in the United States, and that was even before the inflation that's probably going to come from the stimulus packages for the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and all of this adds into a really high attrition rate in archaeology, and I tried to get the numbers for you all, but it's difficult to calculate this. However, many hiring managers and cultural resources companies say that entry-level people who come into cultural resources are only staying in the field about one to five years. At about five years or so, students a lot of times by that time have gone back for a graduate degree to meet the standards to become to be considered a professional archaeologist in the United States, and they may stay longer. But some other research done by a survey through the Southeastern Archaeology uh, Conference showed that at about 35 years old or between 11 and 15 years of experience, there was a big drop in the number of women in archaeology. So obviously, the, the industry is not supportive or conducive to long-term careers. And so this matters a lot when we're trying to recruit students of color, which I put BIPOC for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, because uh, students of color are coming from backgrounds a lot of times where their families and themselves, they want to see a financial outcome and an improvement of their economic situation as a result of going through college. And it's difficult for us to demonstrate that with archaeology the way that it is today. Now, going on about this, the other situations that affect the way we teach archaeology, the funding for state universities in the United States never reached the, um, the point that it was before the uh, real estate collapse in 2008. Part of this is because of these falling enrollments. So over the last decade or so, universities have seen about a 13% decrease. And it's not all universities, of course. Places like UC Berkeley are seeing an increase and all the other prestigious universities are seeing an increase while we start to see some of these, these lower and smaller colleges have a decrease in enrollments. But the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has really made this even worse. Some of the inf information I got from the um, Chronicle of Higher Ed in the United States shows that 
Universities are looking at about a 13% decrease in first year students who applied to the universities. And what's absolutely tragic for our diversification efforts is that this is highest among students of color. So 9.5% or 7 .5 decrease in first year enrollments undergraduate of black students and almost 10% decrease in Native American enrollments. Now, if you remember those numbers I told you in the intro, places like UC Berkeley already have disproportionately small populations of indigenous and African-American and students of color compared to their demographics statewide. And then the final thing is many companies, and it's not just archeology span companies are realizing that the students who finish college are not necessarily prepared for working in the field, right? So going back to my thing about uh, students only working for a few years in archaeology, uh, they're going to have to transition to other industries. And what we're starting to see is that companies are building certificate programs that uh, help provide a gap or provide the specialized experience that they need for students in those uh, in those fields. And probably the most prominent one is the Google Career cer Certificates that puts out several different analytics and uh, programming uh, certificates that it's hoped will retool folks who have not lost their job from the pandemic. But also what I see, this might be a pathway towards larger corporations building their own certificate systems that uh, compete with universities or uh, augment the, the degrees that folks are getting at universities. And it's not just for the tech industry. I just uh, got an, uh, a notification about something called the Arcus Leadership Academy, which is created by archeologists to help train um, archaeology uh, graduates and cultural resource management archaeologists in certain aspects of leadership, collaboration, business development, things that are not necessarily taught in university departments. And where I come from, where I got my PhD in Arizona, uh, it's long, it's a long-standing tradition for cultural resources companies to actually teach the field schools and that CRM folks will either work with universities to build uh, field training programs, or will actually join up in the field and teach the field school. So companies are stepping in and changing the nature of what it means to be an instructor or what it means to be in an anthropology department. And of course, when we go to uh, diversifying and um, uh, decolonizing archaeology, we cannot you know, fail to think about the uprise, the race uprising in the United States that's been happening over the last year or so. Uh, that was sparked off by the George Floyd, George, George Floyd murder in 2020. And there's been a varied response among uh, universities and companies from this anti-racism movement. And some of it is absolute backlash, like the critical race theory witch hunts that are going on in states and universities across the United States, but also an increased silencing of faculty of color who speak out. And uh, there's been reports at several universities of racist incidents that are actually widespread across the United States against faculty by other faculty and students. Okay, so I'm not gonna stay for long on this one because my colleague, Dr. Flewellen already talked about the lack of diversity in archeology. span um, Surveys, as I put here that Dr. Flewellen also mentioned, show that you know there's about 1% or sometimes two black archeologists that are responding to surveys for these organizations. But more recently in the um, fall, the Society of Black Archaeologists actually sponsored a survey of its own members to get kind of a climate um, study of how members feel. And there were 53 folks who responded that said they have African um, ancestry, right? So that compares with you know eight black people in the Society for Historical Archaeology or two in um, uh, the Society for American Archaeology. So we're starting to see that there are actually in fact an increasing number of black people who identify as archeologists. But the question that I ask, you know, is how come they're not joining these organizations? Of course, we know that it's important for us to have students that are in, the, in our departments that are looking towards going into archeology. span But of course, having them come to our organizations and join our organizations is a major aspect of networking and a major part of their career and um, uh, intellectual growth. So the question is how come they're not joining, right? Now, I can't speak for all people of color who are archaeologists, but I can definitely tell you from my own experiences of doing archaeology for 20 years, here's some of the things that I've seen and that I've talked to other people of color of why they left archaeology or won't join up. And it almost all begins with the fact that you're alone, that these organizations don't have people of color necessarily. And so you always end up being the person who's there that represents your entire race. You always end up being the person there who has to be per perform 
in a certain way to try and dispel uh, um, stereotypes about yourself. And it's a really lonely and exhausting situation to be for a lot of people. And so you can imagine students who are just getting into this and they reach these places and they get in here and then they have all these feelings. Now that is also built on top of the fact that it's hard to actually feed yourself doing archeology. span For example, this last year, I passed four years of working here at Cal and I've been doing archeology span for 20 years. This is the longest I've had an archeology span job. I haven't been able to stay at a single place for five years yet. And I've been doing this for 20 years. And then you add in the actual discrimination based on real and perceived physiological differences, which is the hallmark of racism. So all of these things come together and you can kind of see the difficulties that we all are facing when it comes to uh, increasing uh, students of color. But there's a whole nother layer too that it's difficult for us to get past and we actually need to address. And that is the fact that anthropology and archeology span came out of colonialism. It's a, it was you know, derived from that. And our legacy for you know, decades has been that of taking cultural patrimony from people of color and then appropriating it however we wish without consulting them. And I live in the state of California and the state at one time actually in fact had bounties for killing Native American people in the state. And since then, archeologists have excavated burial shell mounds with burials, uh, Native American sites and put away these artifacts over decades and decades at the museums here in the state. And people who are alive that are indigenous remember all of this stuff. And even furthermore, archeologists and anthropologists have testified in court to invalidate tribal claims on land, on uh, resources and on funding by the federal and state government. So we come on a long line of folks who weren't necessarily the good guys and we all wanna actually make things better for the world, but we can't forget the fact that we're coming in 2021 after more than a hundred years of anthropology and archeology span taking from people of color. And so for other people of color, it's this aspect that makes it hard for them to join. Now this slide here comes from uh, an interview and a discussion of, from a local tribal elder of the Amamutsun tribe who describes how his grandparents talked about how it was okay to enslave and kill Native Americans in the state of California and how that has not left the cultural memory of indigenous people in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, so, you know, in a, in a kind of, uh, you know, in a really abbreviated version or, you know, summary of what I just talked about. The only way that we're going to be able to uh, increase diversity and address the, you know, colonialist legacy of archeology span is we have to actually pay attention to the needs of students of color. That's the only way that we're going to be able to convince students of color to shake off everyone in their family and everyone they know telling them that they should not do archeology span because they won't be able to feed themselves. Now in this uh, simplistic pyramid, which is designed as a pyramid specifically, um, the people who have the most need for change and have the, the most precarity in their lives are the students at the bottom that we need to diversify the entire system. And the people at the top who actually have the most control over the hiring and the training and everything of the students also have the least need for change because they're secure in their position or as secure as you can be as an archeologist. And they also are in the least precarious situation. So this call to address the needs of students of color uh, and, and uh, emphasize these transferable skills that people can use and take to other positions and to demonstrate an economically viable pathway that includes archeology span in the future is contingent on people at the top. And if we're looking at an industry that's 99% white, then the people at the top are almost 100% white. So it's all on white archeologists to do this kind of work. Now, the caveat is, of course, by doing this work, it actually threatens the position of white archeologists who are at the top of the pyramid. In the United States, these government contracts a lot of times have set-asides for woman-owned and minority-owned businesses. If those folks at the top did the very best they could and trained students of color, indigenous people, uh, how to do cultural resource management in the way that's uh, prescribed in, a, in the United States law, those folks could start their own businesses and be direct competitors with the people who are right now getting that entire $1.4 billion, right? So us waiting on people at the top to change this entire thing is not, as, is not really going to uh, get the kind of results that we actually are interested in. It's not going to help us 
uh, in the way that we want to see happen. But the, the other thing that's amazing that's going on right now is behind the scenes, while this entire pyramid exists, and this, the strategies I just talked about for the last 20 minutes are what professional archaeologists now can do to keep archaeology as it is alive. But there's other folks in a whole nother movement of people who are creating a whole new kind of archaeology. And the people who are actually professional archaeologists right now are only a small piece of that puzzle. So the different pathway that I'm talking about is something that I saw as a, a researcher at the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology when I was a, a PhD student at the University of Arizona. And in that position, our job was to work with Native American people on different uh, projects that help them stay in compliance with state and federal law. And so what I saw there was folks who were working in their own interest to uh, use archaeology as a way to push for their own rights, legal rights to land and resources, but also to insert their way of knowing into archaeology uh, knowledge. And the entire goal was to revitalize their own cultural knowledge and to rebuild from what had happened to them. And this is just one piece of this larger uh, indigenous archaeologies that we're seeing. But now at this point, I'm starting to see a shift in that indigenous archaeology and that anti-racist archaeology to be more inclusive and try to in address the overall conundrum of archaeology in the 21st century. So this book here, Archaeologies of the Heart, it just came out a few months ago. An excellent collection of scholars are in there. And I recommend that folks, if you have access to it, please check it out. But what this book calls for, the, the editors of the volume call for us to create an archaeology that speaks to the whole person, our intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and physical selves. And what they're asking for us to do is to take the best of our whole selves and practice an archaeology that makes us better people. I feel like this is part of an overall thing that I'm, I'm formulating together in an article for uh, current anthropology but it's really kind of a summary of what's been going on for the last 20 years or so. That's really calling for us to be more attentive. And this is a term that I'm, I'm putting together myself. Um, and I'm, you know, if folks have questions or you know, want to give feedback, go ahead and send me a message. But what I'm starting to see is a call among the 21st century archeologists for a more holistic and future oriented practice that is changing our philosophy of what it means to do archeology span so that we can serve communities in the present. And of course the idea is, by making communities in the present uh, more um, healthy and vibrant, we provide a pathway to overall um, uh, address a lot of the traumas that we're facing as archeologists, because of course, this thing is also talking about um, adding this heart-centered practice to our own selves as human beings in this turbulent world where a lot of things are happening to us. Um, but it's also asking us to relate to each other as building on what archeologies of the heart said, so that we can relate to each other as human beings that are intrinsically connected together in this uh, you know, ever unfolding world that's bringing us even closer together, right? And it builds upon the idea as archeology span for ther as therapy. Uh, and it's been proposed that it's archeology span as therapy to help redress traumas that have happened to traumatized communities. But I think as many of us uh, ponder on our own careers and reflect, we can recognize that pursuing archeology span as a career has also changed our own emotional and psychological well-being as well too. So this attentive archaeology is kind of trying to bring together the heart-centered practice that's promoted here from indigenous archaeology, anti-racist archaeology, community-based collaboration in a, in a goal of uh, attending to social justice, right? But also thinking about the health and safety of the practitioners in the communities that are being involved, including their physical and mental health and addressing inequities in the field that come from these different uh, hierarchies that exist in archeology span today. Uh, what, I, what I envision and what I'm going through the literature and putting together is you know, a really an archeology span that's more aware. It's practitioners that are more aware of who they are and where they're placing their concentration and what that's actually doing to themselves and what that's doing to colleagues and communities, right? You know, what are we paying attention to? What is that actually in fact doing to us? What are we finding from our efforts? What are the results that we're getting both personally and socially from this kind of work, right? Are we focusing more on the work at the, at the um, expense of others, including our own selves, right? But also 
many people are not aware of the role that archaeology has played in, you know, impacting communities of color. So also being aware of what you're not aware of. So being aware of all the things that you never paid attention to, including the needs of other people, the needs of students, the needs of yourself and of communities, right? And paying attention to how your action impacts others. Also being aware that we can have well-intentioned impacts. We can try our hardest to improve communities, but if it's not done in collaboration with communities, if it's not done to try and heal individuals in those communities, including our own community of practitioners, we can actually be causing more damage. So continuing with this business as usual system is hurting ourselves. It's, it's not really serving resources or the spirit of the historic preservation laws. And it's not also helping us, um, our departments at universities, right? And then also by us being inactive, by sitting back and letting things happen, we can also cause as much damage too. Uh, recognizing that we're part of a con continuum. A lot of folks don't want to acknowledge the origins of archaeology and also the way that our laws have been structured that have the chance to continue perpetuating traumas on communities and the practitioners, right? So recognizing our own legacy, but also understanding that it doesn't have to be that way forever, that we can actually be part of change and we can you know, be aware of our actions today in the present so that we can create a better future for archaeologists to come. And also to recognize there's more than one way to do this heritage work. And archaeology is just a small piece of what uh, communities of color are doing to reclaim heritage and revitalize communities. So we're not the only ones who are doing the work. It's not just up to us. And also even among archaeology, uh, it's, you know, we're part of an entire group of people. So siloing our work and staying beholden in one corner without sharing it is not helping the entire endeavor move forward. And then I always recommend that it always starts with people's thoughts in your own mind, because if you change your own thoughts, then there's potential to change your own action. So by working on yourself and being mindful of your own self, that's the absolute key piece, because none of this other stuff can really happen until you're recognizing what this world has done to you and what you plan on doing, try to move forward in your own life, right? So the idea is that you know, we, we can sit back and talk about how things are broken and how much damage things have been done. But, you know, in reality, archaeology is the only thing we have to fix archaeology, right? So if we're going to envision, envision a future, this thing we've inherited that we've been trained in is the thing that we have. So if we, if we want to change it, we have to fix it as is beginning in the present and moving forward. And also the idea that you can't do that kind of work if you're also psychically, physically, and emotionally damaged yourself, right? So in the process of being in this, if harms are happening in the process of you becoming an archeologist and throughout your career, you're not gonna be as able to help others because broken people are not the ones who can fix other broken people. The first step that I recommend for everyone to do, because we are living in this time when you know we're, we're trying to move into anti-racism, we're trying to do all these different things, um, but a lot of times we're not spending any time thinking about what that's doing to ourselves. And we may find ourselves unconsciously or consciously, you know, pushing back against things or jumping headlong into things that only end up adding to our work and overwork that's characteristic of archaeology in general. So, you know, I urge white, white archaeologists that 99% to start thinking about to, in their own mind when the friction of engaging with this, when collaborating, and when you have to engage with anti-racist thought, when you first notice that anxiety, pay attention to your own self and then start thinking about how you can actually stay in that space and build the resilience to be in that space longer, right? Because a lot of folks, a lot of this backlash in departments and companies is coming from people who don't wanna engage in that, the discomfort that comes along with that. And I'm not asking for people to jump into, you know, turbulent waters and harm themselves psychologically, but just touch the edge of the discomfort before you have to step away. And by doing that, you'll get more and more accustomed to being in this uncomfortable place. And then archaeologists of color, if you're out there, if you're listening to this, right, be aware of when this anger happens, when it's flaring up in your own self and think, is this something that's being coming from your own personal experience as a person of color? Or is this actually, in fact, racism that's happening to you? And then is this something that you need to take care of? Or is this something that they need to take care of? Because, of course, these diversity initiatives can't just fall on that 2% of Black archaeologists and 58 uh, members of the SBA can't be the ones who solve the problems of 8,000 other archaeologists. You know, I'm calling for us to really think about um, re reinventing what we think about as archaeology, you know, adding this uh, compassionate and self-aware approach to archaeology into the field, because I think that when communities of color see 
individuals who are actually honestly trying to do good for communities and are aware of themselves and open and willing to be part of these emotional traumatic therapies that come through archeology, span you're gonna to start to see more interest from communities of color. Because at this point, archeologists are coming in with these CRM contracts and talking about where a Walmart's gonna go and where the freeway is gonna go right on top of your ancestral house. And there's not a lot of space for collaboration, right? So a lot of this starts with us who are instructors, right? Rethinking what it means to be an archeologist and an instructor in the United States. A couple of real realities. Funding's going down, we're gonna have fewer students. What does it mean to teach in these spaces? And what do the communities need to grow and prosper? You'll see support for this kind of education if you're actually supporting communities and states and you're doing that kind of work that adds instead of extracts, right? Rethinking our entire profession because the idea of planning for archeologists who are gonna work for 40 years in archeology, span that's kind of a, a you know, a, a non real, it's an aspirational reality rather than a pragmatic reality of the world in which we live. And to recognize that action is what is helping communities by understanding what communities are interested in and what they need to grow and prosper. And a lot of times that is not archaeology. It's those transferable skills and access to, to uh, um, information and the authority that comes with being a professional archaeologist. And of course, getting paid to do archaeology, you know, all of those things in collaboration. So rethinking this professionalism as someone who is helping individuals regain power over their own heritage. Of course, the internet, this talk wouldn't exist without this medium. The last 16 months have showed us we can still connect with each other. And in fact, there's new communities that have thrived and grown through online, our online communities, right? So collaborating through the internet, most of the people in the United States are, are online. And so meeting the public, meeting other people, teaching students, it's all happening online right now. Of course, this is gonna be, you know, building a new future of archeology span in this constantly changing world because our education, not only do we have to revamp curriculum, but it has to be more experiential. That's the only way that we're gonna connect with communities because many people of color have only seen Indiana Jones and Discovery TV and that National Geographic, and they've never seen anyone of color doing archeology span by having them come to their place and see that not only do black people do archeology, span we get PhDs, we teach at universities, that's stuff that most people have never even seen. And also including them in the decisions about their own heritage sites. If you're a cultural resource management archeologist, that consultation can be more than just a letter sent to a black heritage uh, organization or a tribal historic preservation office. And our professionalism, right? Preparing people to work in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different fields. And I feel like this activist, this attentive archeology span can build the kind of employee in the future that whether they're working in archeology span or elsewhere is aware of what the job's doing to themselves and aware of you know, uh, you know, what, their, what their impacts in the workplace are on the rest of the world. And that's something that they can take with them throughout their entire lives, but also understanding that many archeologists are not going to stay there for 40 something years. Nevertheless, they can still act for positive change in the world. And then of course, engagement, not just teaching online, not just building online, but engaging with publics and building alliances with groups that are doing this other kind of heritage. So I don't, I don't know how this all is gonna look, but I have a couple of things from my own experience, my own education that helped me understand where we could possibly go. Like I mentioned before, as a PhD student, I worked for the Bureau of Applied Research in Anthropology, which is a multi, uh, it has several different instructors. It's like a kind of, uh, um, affiliated um, department at the University of Arizona that's affiliated with the anthropology department. And it works through cooperative agreements with Native American tribes, the Department of Defense, the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Forest Service on different kinds of contracts to do collaborative work in compliance with historic preservation regulations. But we also have a goal where, you know, when I work there, it's a continuing goal to include indigenous perspectives and knowledge in the way we consider uh, archeology span and historical sites, while also training uh, indigenous youth how to do cultural resource management for their own tribe, but also giving them the uh, idea that they can do archeology, span they can go to college and they can pursue things outside of the reservation. Because if you haven't gone to a Native American reservation, you, you may not know that they're you know, not the easiest place to grow up in. 
If you want to know a little bit more, this recent article that just came out this week by my former advisor, Dr. Maria Nieves Adenio, and some of my colleagues, Evelyn Pickering and Francois Lenoy, has just come out um, in the Journal of Social Archaeology. And it is an important case study that's showing how oral traditions among the Blackfeet are uh, really informative and give us a lot of information about the end of the Pleistocene and the development of archaeological sites in the, um, at the end of the Ice Age in Montana. So I suggest you check that out if you have access. Now, of course, I'm not going to go uh, deep in this because my colleague uh, Ayana Flewellen also gave a great talk about this, but the Society of Black Archaeologists is also using similar aspects of indigenous archaeologies in my experiences, our experiences with indigenous people to try to do similar things among African-American youth. So our projects on St. Croix involve African-American and Crucian youth on St. Croix uh, to do archaeology. They learn archaeological method and theory, but in the process, we also try to help folks do what we can to have them go to college and uh, you know, to aspire for different dreams and, and really try to support them through that entire process. And it's not just having folks go into archeology, span it's just having black youth go on to college in general. If you wanna know more about that, one of our articles just came out a few months ago. Uh, it looks like last month, I, I have no idea what time it is anymore, but it's a good summary of our community archeology span and engagement there on St. Croix. Now, building online communities, what you're doing right now, watching this talk right now, is probably the best thing that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic for archaeologists because those barriers that we had erected between us, you know, engaging with each other, they kind of went down quite a few notches. And so, you know, the Society of Black Archaeologists for since its conception has really existed on Skype and through uh, online uh, meetings, but we're, we were kind of the only ones that were really doing that kind of collaboration. But now we're part of several other groups and I'm starting to see a lot of amazing collectives and communities grow up on the internet. And the other excellent thing is that we're recording a lot of this stuff and we're putting it out. So it'll be interesting to see 50 years from now as we look back on these videos, just how crazy my ideas were, uh, but also how crazy all of our ideas were here in the 21st century. But the best thing is we'll be able to access those things. We'll be able to see these talks. This stuff is much more accessible than it ever was before. Uh, the la another thing that I'm part of, I've been part of the Archaeology Podcast Network. We have tens of thousands of individuals who download these shows, and we have had hundreds of episodes. I think the CRM Archaeology Podcast has been out since 2012, and we just recorded our 218th episode. So there's a lot of shows that are on here. There's a lot of different interviews, and there's a lot of information about archaeology in general that's being conveyed on the show, on these different shows. And what you can see is hundreds of thousands of people download these things over the years, right? So this engaging and communicating online, this is just archaeology. We can always bring this to our communities into a larger area of practice. All right, in conclusion, you know, the, the whole thing that we need to recognize is that the world as it is, is causing a lot of discomfort for all of us, right? And communities of color have been impacted through just multiple layers of different kinds of uh, violence, trauma, uh, neglect, and lack of support, right? And, and that over the years, uh, and I you know I don't mean to say that uh, people of European descent are free of that too, because the entire process of creating people who are white in the United States involved them uh, internalizing the dehumanization of people of color, and that still ripples through white America today too, right? So where none of us are free in the United States of this entire thing, right? But by confronting this kind of painful past, the thing that came before us that is impacting us in the present, right? And compassionately engaging with that is one of the things that our society needs, right? If you look at the United States news, this polarization and stuff is being amplified and it's cutting down the, the uh, connections that many of us had that help us not be in the cycle of perpetrating violence, surviving violence, and most of us sitting back while it's all happening. And so the uh, attentive archeology span that I'm proposing is trying to get more individuals to move from the bystander to the hero position, to intervene and to support survivors by also cutting out the perpetrators of racism and violence. And we can do that by being aware of what we are and remodeling the way that we handle ourselves as scholars to move more into that activist hero position. In close, you know, the attentive archaeology and being aware of yourself and the impact of your work, <clears throat> I feel like that's exactly what, uh, you know, many of these different 
uh, collaborative and indigenous and anti-racist archeology span pieces have been asking for all of us to do. They've been asking for us to pay attention to who we are, pay attention to the world and pay attention to what this practice, practice is doing to us right now because we don't live in a vacuum and there's all kinds of stuff coming from throughout society and our economies that are affecting us, right? And I'm also asking for us to remodel education and to focus on preparing students to just do work and to be the kind of activist that's going to move uh, this world forward. And I feel like archaeology is an excellent field that can do that. And we can really do a great job of preparing folks for the future. And when it comes to increasing diversity, the first thing we have to do is be more comfortable engaging this painful past ourselves, but also more, uh, more willing to try and build initiatives specifically for students of color by, you know, it, it's, it's basically breaking federal law to specifically look at students of color and try to ask them what they need and how archaeology can help fulfill those needs, right? Once we adjust our focus towards BIPOC people, it's going to decenter the kinds of people who have actually been in charge of archaeology for a long time. And I would really hope that those folks are able to be introspective on themselves and attentive to their own responses to this entire thing, because this is going to challenge the status quo. And uh, white archaeologists, if we do actually, in fact, decolonize and diversify archaeology, will no longer be in the center of the field. Um, I apologize for going a bit long, but uh, here are some links to some organizations and things that mean a lot to me. And of course, I appreciate every minute that you've given me of your day. Thank you very much. And we have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. White, for this truly emotional and very timely presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone else enjoyed it just as much as I did. Um, yes, we're all open for questions now. So if you want to post some, either use the hand raise button or post it into the chat. Um, until then, I actually do have a question if that's all right. Um, so as someone who is teaching, predominantly teaching white undergrads, mm -hmm. um, I noticed that there is this sense of diversifying archaeology and, and creating an inclusive practice is all well and good, but this has nothing to do with me um, because loads of the undergrads um, I teach are doing classical archaeology, archaeology in Germany, for example. So the community aspect and the collaborative aspect isn't as big. So how can we convey the importance and relevance of attentive archaeology and diversifying the discipline to these students? Um, you know, sure, that's a great question. I, as you can tell, have spent my whole career working in the United States. So, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with that. And I also know that this idea of uh, attentive archaeology is only really going to resonate with a small percentage of the overall people who are doing archaeology. But one of the key things to remember is that it's got the attentive part, but also the archaeology part. And we don't have to get rid of all the ranges of archaeology, especially if we're learning more about the past and, you know, we're doing actual quality archaeological work. All of that archaeology that we're doing that's quantitative, that's, you know, focused on things like the environment and other things that non-human uh, aspects of the past, you know, all of that stuff is absolutely valid. We don't actually need all of the archaeologists to change their awareness and become indigenous archaeologists or intentive or anti-racist, right? Uh, all we really need is for a, a critical mass, right? A certain percentage. I don't know how many that is. You know, I don't know if it's 5%, if it's 10% or whatever. Um, but a couple of the things that are, you know, coming, like it's all riding on the same wave as the social justice movement has made these things much more prominent. And many archaeologists have seized the time to, you know, talk about what we're doing to publish in journals and to get this stuff out there, right? And we also are only going to teach a small number of students. And, and like I mentioned, only a few of those are going to go on to ever be archaeologists, right? So we don't need every single archaeologist to be an intensive archaeologist, but just to know that this is what is being called for in, over the last 20 years from archaeologists of color, um, indigenous archaeologists, uh, people in many different countries, they're publishing things about uh, trying to be more inclusive and collaborative and the attentiveness, the attentive archaeology, I feel like this approach, this mindfulness approach, um, it, it rolls a lot of that stuff together into an umbrella because that's what people of color are saying. Now, that being said, 
ignoring those voices, of course, is also causing harm. So folks who want to stay qualitative and never think of the fact that there's any kind of community, you know, uh, otherwise, they're cutting, they're limiting their research potential and their potential for that to engage and contribute to people at the local level. But they're also um, like um, cutting them own selves off from personal growth by engaging with these different ideas. So we don't need everyone to switch over, but just know that those who are willing to at least come close, learn what it's all about a little bit and walk away with a different understanding, that's gonna be enough to change a lot of people because I understand that we're not gonna change that 8,000 archeologists in my lifetime, you know, to be mindful and, and considerate and all that stuff, you know. I've been doing this for a little bit of time and I don't think that everyone's gonna switch, but I do think in the future, this can grow in the future to the point where those folks are kind of in the minority and attentive folks are more uh, in the majority. Thank you, thank you. Um, Suzanne, you had a question? Thank you so much um, for this really wide ranging <laughs> presentation. I, I, was, I was wondering if, to what extent you, you see a role, especially in the CRM area also for labor organizing, because in, in the UK, that's one issue where um, people who work in the sector are very poorly paid. And, mm -hmm. and so that in itself, I mean, there are kind of bigger problems there, but also then that that is, is, you know, one kind of very demonstrable way that excludes people from entering the profession. And I don't know enough about um, CRM in the in the US about, you know, how well people are paid, but you know, that here, that's like definitely an issue. And, mm -hmm. and, and people who work in the sector are, are only gradually getting organized, but it's really just beginning. So yeah, is it is it very yeah. different in the US? Or? No, we are also, I think you actually are ahead of us. So if you think it's just <laughs> developing there, then it's like in the dark ages in the United States as far as organizing. Um, yeah, you know, the pay is, is an absolutely huge thing. And um, I believe on the 21st of June, there's going to be a talk about organizing in the United States, unionizing archaeological uh, field technicians, I believe. And, and uh, you know, I've been looking on social media at some of the responses. They're not necessarily good, but it's social media. So you can't really, everyone, it's only negative on social media. You don't know how people actually feel. Um, but I know in the 1990s, they tried to organize and uh, create a union. But the problem is, of course, it's difficult to, there's no one with whom to bargain, like collectively bargain because the companies aren't all unified together under one organization. And then it's difficult to uh, stand as one block because there's always a group of people who will do the work for less. But the biggest thing that has been happening I've seen is uh, archeologists saying on social media when they see the advertisement, just responding, show me the wages, like show me the pay rate, show me the pay rate. And people not, the qualified and skilled people not willing to even apply for the lower uh, paying projects. And I feel like just that kind of like, you know, grassroots thing. And there's been, you know, we've talked about it on the podcast, blog post, you know, gone off on social media and many companies have responded. They've started putting their pay rates and they know that they're gonna embarrass themselves if it's much lower than others. So there's that aspect of forcing them to show how much they're really paying people. And then the other thing is just the demand right now, right? As I mentioned, there's fewer people who just finished we just entire year and a half lost all the people who would have a field school, right? So that qualification barrier has got to come down because no one got one during the pandemic, right? So all these new entering field techs, they the companies have to start an internal training program because they can't just expect them to actually know anything. And I've been talking to other, uh, oh, and also uh, archeology span was considered an essential service during the pandemic. So the company stayed open. They kept working the whole time. And if this new infrastructure thing comes, we're talking hundreds more archeologists the United States is gonna need at a time when there's fewer people who are skilled. So they've those barriers, some of them have had to come down and companies are more willing to hire folks on recommendation and uh, you know without a field school and train them up and try to build these internal training programs or collaborate with universities to try and get those skills out. So I feel like maybe that's one barrier that might be coming down. but. I think that the pay thing is intrinsically linked to increasing diversity because it's, it's very difficult for students of color to get to a university in the first place and then to recognize they're only gonna get paid, you know, 
$23,000 a year for their entry level with no benefits or guarantee for work past Christmas. Like that's, that's a tough sell when you can get a job at Amazon making more money than that with your anthropology degree entry level. You know what I'm saying? Like the competition in the Bay Area, they pay higher wages here because they just can't even convince anyone to do the work otherwise. So I think that unionizing will definitely help. We're, like I said, we're in the like earliest grain of truth stage. Like it, it hasn't even grown yet from that. Thanks. Uh, Christina, you posted something to the chat. Do you want to read it out or do you want to ask us yourself or should I read it? Here, I, um, I don't have my video on because it's early in the morning over here, <laughs> but I'm sure I'll read it out. Um, uh, hi, William White, uh, good to meet you. Um, I'm um, Christina Hernandez and I'm based in California, um, but I have one foot in, in the UK as well as a postgraduate uh, researcher at the University of Leicester. And I've taught for a number of years at um, community college in California. And uh, one of the things I've always noticed is that, you know, so many disciplines are not taught in American high schools like um, archaeology or my discipline in art history. And so we're losing students in the humanities and um, archaeology programs before they even get to college. They don't even know uh, about the uh, subject. So I wondered if there were any um, efforts that you saw happening for some of the U universities to collaborate with community colleges, uh, because I think that it's a, a real fertile ground where uh, it's inexpensive and um, students, uh, there are a much more diverse body of students at community colleges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because the good news is there is. Uh, for folks that don't know, the University of California system, there's several different campuses that are part of the UCs. And um, uh, half of the incoming freshmen each year in the University of California, Berkeley, come from the community college system. In the community colleges, there's many more. I think there's like 20. I'm sorry, I don't know how many community colleges there are in the state of Ooh, California. Lots, uh, about uh, yeah. hundred and, I think we're 112 campuses in California. Okay, yeah, so many students are able to get into UC Berkeley, UCLA, and other UC schools by doing well in the community college system, which is much more accessible, much more affordable. And then after two years, you can transfer to one of the UCs, right? So, uh, you know, the, the great thing that the University of California Berkeley is doing, there's a couple of couple of things that uh, for many years, there's been a community outreach and public education thing through the archeological research facility, where before the pandemic, we actually went to elementary schools and middle schools and brought archeology span related activities to those schools. Now that was like, everybody wanted that thing to happen, right? And we tried to do our best to really focus on schools in Richmond and Oakland, California that have a lot of diversity and they never really see you know people of color doing archeology. span so. We'd bring that to those youth and it's anywhere from six year olds to you know 12 years old would do these different archaeology activities at school after school for free uh, but of course we can only do that sometimes you know we don't have the capacity to always go to all these elementary schools so the other thing that developed before i even got there um, uh, dr meg conkey developed an entire archaeology curriculum system and so for years when she was a professor at UC Berkeley, they, students created curriculum modules in American archeology, span California archeology. Span and by the time I got here in 2017, they had you know, hundreds of curriculums that had been made by all these students over the years. And so we started um, trying to take the ones that fulfilled requirements under the state of California's education requirements for social studies, STEM, and uh, like arts and humanities and try to take some of these modules and make them available to public school students through the archeological research facility website. So this, the um, teachers can email us and then we give them access to the database and then they could download the different ones. And of course, you know, some of them are from like the 90s. So it's just only a Microsoft Word document. Then others of them actually had, you know, pictures and other stuff that's along with it. And some of that is working in, 
uh, collaboration with the Hearst Museum, which was show, doing Ask an Archaeologist Day and showing artifacts that they had, and then having UC Berkeley instructors who are you know, skilled in classical archaeology or South Pacific archaeology talk about these artifacts that are in the collection on videos. And so those, those things already existed before the pandemic. And um, the newest thing that I've talked to some instructors at uh, UC uh, at San Jose State and uh, University of California, San Francisco, and some of the other community colleges about putting together kind of a research Bay Area group of scholars who do archaeology and trying to teach a lot of these non-excavation related skills, either as internships or through class curriculum and stuff like that, and then to share the teaching across these different universities, right? So, you know, share the research and share the teaching. So some scholars will be working at a project somewhere in the Bay Area, and then, you know, we will encourage students to go to that project and go through that university, or there might be a lab project at another university. We'll try to have students, you know, go to that university. So California Archaeology Projects as kind of a consortium of scholars that are trying to give students opportunities. And the benefit is you don't have to be in the field every single year. And there's professors that have projects that need, you know, they need people to help them process it. And so we can direct students around the Bay Area to these different opportunities. And that has only really started since the pandemic and we haven't really got it off the ground, but the idea is to try and share the knowledge and workspace and projects amongst the students so that they'll get many different opportunities to work in a lot of different ways of archeology. span Thank you. Oh, Paul, do you want to ask a question as well? Yeah, thank you. William, thank you so much for that really fascinating and very wide ranging and really sort of thought provoking presentation, which is, is really, uh, yeah, I think sort of is uh, the, the icing or, or the cherry on the icing, if you like, for our, our series. A wonderful way to round off our, our, our talks. Um, if I understood you correctly, you were acknowledging, I think, something that many of us recognize that, that Archaeology, when it's taught correctly, really taught, teaches a very wide range of skills that are, are extremely transferable. And that it is important to recognize that uh, some students will, will come through a, a, an archaeology program and move on into other forms of work. Is, and as part of the diversification of that intake, that is, if, if you can draw um, people of color into the archaeology program and then equip them with you know enhance their their opportunities in the in the wider workplace that is also beneficial i, I think that's what you one of the things that you were saying um, i recognize there are other issues to address to retain some within the di discipline but in that former sense i just wondered whether you you or uc berkeley are doing any work with local companies in the Bay Area who may themselves be wanting to sort of you know, improve and diversify their workforce, but also to um, bring in uh, a younger generation who are able to deal with qualitative, quantitative, teamwork, individual, project reporting, present, all of those things that we, we, we get our students to do. Um, and I was just wondering whether that is something that you've been exploring. Yeah, absolutely. And so I can't speak for all of my colleagues at UC Berkeley, but you know, I came from the University of Arizona and you may not know this, but <laughs> Arizona is this really uh, closed off and standoffish archeological community where many people went to Arizona or Arizona State or Northern Arizona University and they're not willing to really hire anyone who comes from outside of the state. And when I first came there, the way that I was able to find work is I was a historical archeologist. So they had many people that were doing Hohokam or uh, ancestral Puebloan or Mexican borderlands archeology, span pre-contact archeology, span but almost no one wanted to handle these 20th century ranches and you know, all the other stuff that comes along with that. So that was how I was able to get in. But I learned over time that the reason why that happens is because um, the you know people who run the Arizona State Parks and the State Historic Preservation Office and you know uh, different counties like the city of Phoenix and other county agents they all went to these universities 
And the people who teach the field schools at the universities also work for the CRM companies there. So they teach them what they need to know for Arizona. So they just are able to recruit directly from the field school into their companies. And then they're able to retain those folks because they're, they build these uh, limits at the state level on who can actually get a permit to do work on public lands and stuff. Of course, those are created by people who graduated from Arizona universities. So the entire thing is set up in a way that is, is helping people from the state of Arizona get work in archaeology. It makes it much harder for us unless we somehow find a way to get into that research to do that. And so, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I want the state of California to be as, you know, um, isolated as archaeology is in, in Arizona, but I am saying there's a lot of potential for collaborating with companies because one of the one of the biggest recruiting problems is paying people enough money and having them be willing to live in the Bay Area because many people come from outside of the Bay Area and then they get hit with the sticker shock and they realize that, you know, their life is not what they actually wanted it to be because they don't get paid enough money. However, people who have grown up in the Bay Area, they love it here and they're multiple generations deep and they're willing to stay here and they have the social networks to help them that a lot of times make it easier to get paid what would be considered a huge wage in other places, but it's just like livable wages here in California. So uh, California, if we can recruit more people from the Bay Area that are used to this lifestyle, then the companies don't have to pay the transfer costs they have folks that are right here in the area that are local, so they don't have to put them up in hotels. They don't have to build crews from all over the place. And it's only been recently talking with a few of the country's companies here in the San Francisco Bay Area that they realize the opportunity of just reaching out to the universities to help select students and then train them as interns. Or uh, one thing that I'm trying to work on is having uh, short-term projects that are kind of like, you know, one day cultural resource projects have like a job shadow thing where, you know, a student who's interested in archaeology can shadow an actual archaeologist with a company who needs an entry level position for a one day job. That person fills out all their employment paperwork to work for that one day. So that's already in the company database. And then this person, it's easier for them to take these, you know, short term projects that, that an actual employee of the company, you know, they would cost them too much to put them on because, you know, they really need to be employed on the longer projects, right? Rather than these one term and it's harder for, they have to spend money to recruit someone for a one day project. Whereas if they already have a student who knows the paperwork system, who knows the company and all this other stuff through these different temporary uh, projects over a year or so, they're getting valuable information. And I've talked with a lot of company owners and hiring managers, and they've said, you know, like one or two weeks of doing cultural resources is probably better than your field school in St. Croix or probably better than a field school you know, somewhere else because I have no idea what you learned out there. But if you were with me for a week or two, I know exactly what you just learned out there and I know where we need to go from there for you to catch up. And so I think a lot of the companies in the Bay Area, you know, they, they love the idea. Then the pandemic happened and they got too busy and now no one has any time to, to talk, right? But the best thing is they, they're at full employment. So the students I've talked to, they're getting interviews and they are getting these summer jobs because right now there's a lot of jobs in archaeology in California. And it's a sad reality that, you know, when the fires start once again, there's going to be even more jobs in the fall. So um, I am trying to build that out because it's what I saw when I was in Arizona and I know it already exists. Thank you. That's, that, that, that sounds really promising. One of the other things behind, when I was using the word company, probably I was using in, 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 in far too sort of English a way, because what I also had in mind is non-archaeological businesses, if you like. So do you work with banks, law firms, other you know, routes of employment where you, you kind of convince them that, that actually having an archaeology degree is a really great st stepping stone to having a successful middle management, for example? Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. I've only really started with the, the companies, the cultural resources companies. So, you know, I haven't really gone that direction, but I've started doing some data analysis just through hiring job boards and stuff. And I want to move it to the next level. But of course, in the United States, folks get an anthropology degree. And so in the Bay Area, of course, uh, tech companies are hiring anthropologists. And that's where a lot of our students go on to work because um, like, you know, anthropology just as a overall endeavor has more of those transferable person skills, the soft skills than something like software engineering, right? So if you have a company that's full of software engineers, they may not actually in fact understand the cultural, 
cultural implications of what their work is doing or the the workplace culture, whereas an anthropologist is trained to think about people and how people are interacting and stuff like that. So a lot of companies are hiring anthropology majors. I just haven't put together the data on that because then the next step would be to try to connect with those companies, right? Because the first step is to demonstrate to students, like you don't have to just come with me to St. Croix and dig in the sun. You can also go work at Apple. You can work, you know, for many of the subsidiaries of all these tech companies, but I haven't gotten to that I know that they are hiring most of our uh, students, but I haven't gotten to the point where I can actually tell them what positions they're getting or what, what life is like at these companies, right? So obviously in the Bay Area, it would be tech. That would be the thing. Like everybody's just kind of like, how am I gonna get into tech? How am I gonna work in tech? That's the biggest industry in the area. So that would be my most logical step to go that direction. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? I know we've had quite a few, um, but now is your chance. Well, All you can right. always email me too. You have more yeah, chance. Yeah, I was going to suggest that as well. So yes, <laughs> thank you everyone for um, for this lovely Q&A and thank you Dr. White again for, mm -hmm. for being here and for this amazing presentation um, and for letting us record it and put it on YouTube as well. I'm, I'm sure many, many people will enjoy it afterwards as well. Um, 